Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the conference this morning. The first speaker is Mike Collins, and um, he is keen to get a flying start. So with no further ado, introduce Mike Collins as the keynote speaker for this morning on paratuberculosis. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and I um, thank the organizers for putting paratuberculosis squarely on this program and honoring me with a keynote a lecture today. Um, as a brief introduction, I come from the state of Wisconsin, which is up in the north central part of the United States, and we're most famous for dairy cows and beer. And we have about as many cows as do the countries of Ireland or the Netherlands. So the dairy industry is important to our well-being. Our herd sizes range quite widely in Wisconsin with a mean herd size of uh, 133 cows, and so we have small grazing herds and we have herds of 3,000 or more cows. So we have to be able to serve all of those uh, types of industries. Today I want to begin talking about paratuberculosis with how it all began, because it really began with a bovine veterinarian, a man who was trying to deal with a cow that had chronic weight loss, low productivity, and um, was not responding to treatments. That veterinarian was astute enough when the cow died to send tissues to the laboratory in Dresden, where Yoni and his American colleague Frothingham um, evaluated the pathology there and recognized that this resembled tuberculosis but wasn't really quite the same disease. And since that time, we have uh, ascribed Yoni's name to this disease in many countries. In the United States, we recognized it first in 1908, and in Wisconsin, there was an agriculture experiment station report in 1922, fully describing the pathology, the methods for culturing the organism, and they found the disease in a relatively small number of herds, and they issued this report for the express purpose of telling farmers and veterinarians that we don't have many herds that are infected yet, and if we do something about this right away, we can avoid the introduction of this disease to other dairy herds. In the, American, the Journal of American Veterinary Medical Association in 24, two years later, were additional warnings that there were just a few number of sources of this infection, and we have an opportunity to stop the spread to other herds. Going on to warn that if we don't do something about this, this disease is going to become as problematic for the industry as tuberculosis was for the present generation. This is a global, ep global epidemic, and starting in 1895 with Yoni, we see the spread to the United States, as I mentioned, then the spread to Australia as it built its dairy industries, and we continue to witness the same mistake being made by other developing countries. Um, as I worked in Chile for a year, we founded there in 1958, later in, first in cattle, later in sheep, and then in goats, and the most recent USDA survey in the United States cultured paratuberculosis from 61% of U.S. dairy herds, which translates to an estimated true prevalence of 91% of U.S. dairy herds. Clearly, the prophecy uh, was correct. Crohn's disease appears in this timeline in 1913, and it remains to be determined whether this is a coincidence or there's a causal association. The organism, as you know, is Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis today, commonly abbreviated MAP. Here you see it as an acid fast stain section of a bovine ileum, and on the right side, a scanning electron micrograph. This organism has evolved to be an obligate parasite, meaning it only replicates in infected animals. And it's adopted strategies for hanging out in the environment as long as possible waiting to be ingested and begin replication in a new host. And this is important to the biology. The clinical disease, as you know, is one of uh, chronic weight loss. But these animals, while decreased in production and looking poorly, uh, have a normal appetite. And they continue eating well, and they typically have diarrhea. And the onset of these clinical symptoms begins shortly after calving. But they've been incubating the infection for a long period of time. The gross pathology is obvious. You can see on the bottom side there the thickened intestine. You'll also see prominent Peyer's patches. 
You'll see enlarged lymph nodes, not only in the ileocecal region, but also the mesenteric lymph nodes. And if you slice through those lymph nodes, you see that they're very reactive with a lot of white areas indicating the influx of macrophages and T cells. The clinical disease has a long, prolonged incubation period. These data from Australia on dairy cattle show that following infection, usually as a calf, there's an incubation period lasting five years or so, but it's widely ranging from as young as two years to as old as 12. And the typical infection progression, again beginning at birth, is that sometime after first calving, the animals begin shedding the organism in their feces. Soon after that, they develop an antibody response that's detectable in, in serum or milk and eventually they develop clinical disease. But the challenge for this disease is that for a long period of time, these animals have been infectious while looking clinically normal. So the infection is spreading long before the farmer or veterinarian realizes it. Obviously, the diagnostic tests vary in sensitivity depending on the stage of disease. This begins as an intestinal infection, but eventually spreads through the bloodstream to all of the tissues of the body. And data from um, Australia on sheep in particular have shown that muscle tissue, commonly infected, 59% of muscle tissue with one and a half logs of organism, peripheral lymph nodes distant from the GI tract, harboring over 100 organisms per gram of tissue. And the organism we now recognize has a broad host range. It includes all of the ruminants, obviously, but also it's been reported in pigs, it's been reported in horses, it's most recently been reported in racing camels in Saudi Arabia. It's occurred twice in history and been published uh, in primates, rhesus monkeys and mandrel baboon in, in particular. And the big question today, of course, is whether human beings are on this list of broad host range. There are some species differences as this infection finds its way into other species. In bison, you'll see some classical uh, clinical signs with, in terms of weight loss, but you don't see much histopathology. And there are strain, cattle strains can infect bison, but there can be bison strains as well, and those strains are particularly difficult to um, grow in the laboratory. The pathology is also seen higher in the GI tract with more um, small intestine pathology and mesenteric lymph node involvement. And you can find the details of that published by Klaus Vergelt and colleagues. In goats, uh, the tenacious nature of a goat is that they'll hang on with this infection for a long period of time without showing obvious clinical signs. And it's really at the last ditch um, before they're ready to die that they actually begin manifesting low body condition. And they may or may not develop any diarrhea at all. This book, I hope uh, all of you will read, called Spillover by David Quammen. It is about the spillover of infectious agents out of animal populations and into human populations. And veterinarians are the heroes of almost every chapter in this book, dealing with Ebola virus, West Nile virus, brucellosis, Lyme disease, and the like. But I'm going to use this concept of spillover to talk about paratuberculosis. It has spilled over from our domestic populations into exotic ruminants. And about half of North American zoos have, been ha have had a diagnosis of paratuberculosis in their exotic ruminants, like the springbok, the, the bonobok, and the nyala shown here. Many times, however, it's actually the domestic species in these zoos that have um, been diagnosed as infected. And the major risk for these zoos are the importation of domestics like these goats, particularly into petting zoos, um, which introduces the infection to the, to the zoological institution. It is spilled over to free-ranging wildlife, and there are dozens of reports, and I'm only showing a few, but this is one of the early ones from 1983, where Dr. Beth Williams and colleagues showed that uh, Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep and Rocky Mountain goats um, are naturally infected, were found naturally infected with paratuberculosis. And they were able to transmit the infection experimentally to mule deer. In Scotland, they uh, showed that 
around farms that are infected, you can go and culture the organism from a wide range of animals. In this study, they confirmed the infection in 90 animals representing 10 different species, everything ranging from foxes to rabbits to badgers. In Chile, down in Tierra del Fuego, in the very southern tip of South America, um, guanaco, the ancestors of the llama and alpaca, were sampled at, at the time of hunting. This population is, is managed and to control the, the number of guanaco on these properties, and, which they share with about a million sheep in that region, and they were able to culture from not quite 5% of the animals of paratuberculosis from fecal samples. Now, we commonly will depict the epidemiology of an infection like this as going both ways between wildlife and domestic species, but I don't think that really is a correct picture. My view of this, and it's only my view, is that most of this is truly spilling over out of the domestic populations and into wildlife, and only occasionally and under special conditions will it actually spill back to domestic species. So I don't think we're facing the kind of situation we have with badgers and TB. It spills over into food products from these food producing animals and in multiple countries uh, investigators have tested HTST pasteurized milk and recovered live paratuberculosis organisms. Admittedly low numbers from a low percentage of samples, but it's been done in multiple countries. It's been documented to spill over into cheese. In Scotland, a study of artisanal cheeses, whether made from pasteurized or unpasteurized milk, were culture positive at a rate as high as 25%. It spills over into meat made from these animals, and some of the best work I've seen has been done by our Irish colleagues here. Um, in this study, I excerpted a table from that publication. I want you to focus on the green boxes here, which highlight tissues distant from the GI tract, head lymph nodes, thoracic organs, prescapular and popliteal lymph nodes. And down here in this box are, are the data for cows that were included in this study because they were ELISA positive, but clinically normal. And these circles show the tissues from those animals that were culture positive. So three out of four of those ELISA positive clinically normal cows already had a disseminated MAP infection. This is what one of those cows looks like. It's a cow photographed in Wisconsin. It was in a study herd and it was selected from this herd because it was strongly ELISA positive. I bought that cow. I don't think I got a good deal, but I I bought that cow for $1,000, took it to the university, and, and took it apart, and we found a disseminated mycobacterial infection. You would never guess that to look at her. And those kind of animals, of course, generally go into the food supply, and they become a happy meal. It has been documented to spill over into infant formula, tragically. And a recent publication by Botsaris and colleagues found that almost 10% of 32 samples purchased from retail stores were culture positive for paratuberculosis, even more PCR positive. And this disease, this agent, of course, has been linked to human disease. Uh, Crohn's patients uh, suffer from chronic diarrhea and weight loss. They frequently have to have surgery to remove the affected part of the intestine because it's stenosed, as you see in this slide. And the intestine looks exactly the same as the intestine from a cow with Yoni's disease. In fact, Dalziel, when he first reported this in the medical literature in 1913 in Scotland, said, gee, this looks just like Yoni's disease. So even a surgeon could diagnose it. And the review article most recently that has analyzed all of the body of literature published in the world about this association states that there's a strong and consistent association of MAP and Crohn's disease. We don't know if this association is causal. Proving causality in humans is extremely challenging. Who can help spill this, uh, stop this spillover? Well, it, it is uh, bovine practitioners in my estimation. Thanks for the slide, Jason. So let's get back to uh, buoyatrics and talk about what happens on the farm. First of all, how does a farm or a country get paratuberculosis? Well, you actually pay for it, you buy it. 
And again, my Irish colleagues have done a nice job of illustrating where the major risks are in terms of acquiring paratuberculosis in this study, in this table, they showed that the highest risk factor was from directly importing cattle. And in this study, they showed that they bought it from many different countries in the world. So prevention is the key, and, and that is the song we must sing to many of our as yet not infected herds in the world. And I rest uh, the blame for this continued transmission of paratuberculosis around the world squarely on the shoulders of OIE. Their chapter on paratuberculosis is antiquated. It uses old diagnostics. It uses individual animal testing, which will not work to prevent this disease. It fails to uh, follow the, the lessons learned from brucellosis and TB. It does not require herd-level testing before international movement. And... It does not reward countries that have spent time and effort to develop national programs. And I think both of those things are essential if we're going to stop the spread of this infection. For cattle breeders who trade live animals, it's essential that they eradicate this infection. And make no doubt, it can be eradicated. It's an obligate pathogen, and we can clean the environment, and we can rid the farm of all of the infected animals. To do this, you have to use the most sensitive diagnostic tests, and today that represents culture or PCR on uh, fecal samples. I always advocate to breeders that they trade genes, not germs. We have great uh, artificial insemination technology and embryo transfer technology that can allow them to improve the genetics of their herd without actually having to trade live animals. However, I know that's part of their tradition, and so it's probably not going to stop. But if they're going to trade animals, they need to know how to trade safely based on herd-level diagnostics, based on classifying herds, based on their likelihood of being free of infection. And many countries have established programs to do just that. I highlight this one from the United States, and this complicated table shows our herd classification system with six levels across the top and down the side. For different herd sizes, you see multiple different kinds of tests. And what I want to emphasize is that these kinds of programs, whether it's in Australia or in the United States or in other countries, have systems in place to make this very affordable, allowing low-cost tests to be used, at least early in the certification plan system. There are multiple testing options. We allow ELISA, we allow culture, we allow pooled samples to be tested, environmental samples to be tested to make it as easy as possible to enter into such a system. And we make it easy in that not every single test has to be negative. In fact, in the early days, only a, a low percentage of the animals, um, a low percentage are allowed to be test positive. These programs need to be used. But it's not essential that Big Brother be the one to run these programs. It's also possible for breed organizations to take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and run their own certification program, requiring that their sanction, at their sanctioned sales, animals come from, the animals be test negative, the dam be test negative, and eventually the herd be test negative, so that they can safely trade animals amongst themselves and improve the health and well-being of their breed. It may be possible to uh, select for genetic resistance. There are multiple studies that have found SNPs um, that can mark cattle that are more resistant to paratuberculosis. But at best, we're going to be able to remove the resistance about 5%. So genetic uh, resistance selection may be part of the solution, but it's not the total solution. The real solution begins on the farm, and I want to next talk about are commercial dairy herds. You've all heard many times, I'm sure, how to control paratuberculosis. It's a fecal oral transmitted disease, so there are two basic strategies. You have to raise caviar uh, animals in, a, in the most hygienic conditions possible, avoid transmission from the adult cows to those calves through hygienic measures, and you have to find the infectious animals in the herd and cull them or isolate them so that they have limited opportunity to pass this infection. It's very straightforward. This is not rocket science. We've been doing this for decades. 
And today we have dozens and dozens of diagnostic tests to choose from. These are commercialized, standardized, and licensed by many countries around the world, so you can reliably use those, lab, use those tests. In, in some countries, like the United States, we even certify by proficiency testing our laboratories to assure that when those tests are used in the lab, the results are reliable and reproducible. I want to spend a minute talking about ELISA, because in commercial dairy herds, low-cost tests are essential to drive these programs. And ELISA is a method for quantifying the amount of antibody, and it can be done in serum or it can be done in milk. And traditionally, these tests have some level that is the cutoff point, above which we classify the test as positive, below which we call it negative. But those levels of antibody can be interpreted much more um, effectively by calling them high positive, medium positive, or low positive, based on the magnitude of that ELISA result, which every laboratory will get. And so I urge practitioners to not accept positive-negative classifications from test results from their laboratories, but rather to ask for those numerical results or the word interpretations, high, medium, and low, because those have very important um, practical uses on the farm. And I use this study from Texas in the United States as an illustration. In this study, they followed over 2,800 Holstein cows through their entire productive life. And they classify the cows based on their ELISA result, again, high, medium, or low positive. And there was a direct correlation between how much money that cow was going to make for the farmer and how much milk that cow was going to produce and that ELISA result. So clearly, it's more important for the farmer to cull and replace those high positive cows than it is the ones that are medium or low. It's the high positive cows, it's only the high positive cows that I think we must mandate be culled. Those are the cows that are almost certainly going to go clinical on their, after the next calving. They're not likely to even survive the next lactation. They're going to, um, these are the cows that have the highest probability of have already having developed a disseminated infection, passing the infection to their fetus. These are the most infectious cows on the property, logarithmically more organisms being shed from feces than the cows that had a medium or low result. And if those cows go into the main maternity pen, they're going to contaminate that pen, and calves born in that pen after them are going to be exposed. The other cows, I think, should be labeled, so everybody in the farm knows that they're ELISA positive, medium or low, and they should be designated to calve in the sick cow pen, not the main clean maternity pen where only ELISA negative cows are calved. These control efforts are not without cost, and many producers, when uh, you outline a program like this, will feel that the cost of the control program is more than the cost of the disease. And I want to illustrate this point with the grand experiment. The United States does a lot of crazy things, and um, the politics today being no exception. And I think it's useful for other countries to look at the crazy things we do and pick uh, and learn from uh, some of those things. In the United States, we had a huge investment in um, uh, paratuberculosis beginning in 2003. And this graph from the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture illustrates several points. A little complicated, let me lead you through it. We kicked off the program with a $20 million investment in 2003. And in subsequent, and as we made that large investment, we got more herds to enroll in the program, the light blue bars. Some of those herds were in the test negative program even, the darker uh, violet bars. But then the money slowly started decreasing on an annual basis. And as the money uh, invested by the United States decreased, so too did the number of herds participating in the program. Collectively, over a decade, we spent $166 million, and at our best, we achieved uh, enrollment of less than 1% of all of the U.S. cattle herds. So from that, I conclude that farmers will in, invest and participate in paratuberculosis programs, provided somebody else 
helps pick up some of the cost. Back to my favorite cow again. If you looked at this cow, and as I did with the producer who owned her and said, she's strong positive, this is the cow I'm, that I just told you is going to go clinical next lactation, is the most infectious cow in your herd. She has to be called. Naturally, the farmer's going to say, she had, she had a great production record. I love her genetics. I want her calf. I don't see a reason to cull this cow. And it's a logical question. So I don't think really that we need better diagnostic tests. I think we know how to control this disease and we have all the diagnostic test power that we need. What we need is a better business model. And I think when processors step up to the plate and pay producers for milk from test negative herds, we will see this program operate naturally. It'll be a market driven program. Producers will seek those premiums for, uh, and, and they will get their herds to be test negative quite readily. It's a fairly straightforward concept that healthy food comes from healthy animals. And I think it's a biological fact that animals with paratuberculosis are simply not healthy. And it's a very simple policy that products for food, for human consumption, should be sourced from test negative herds. And this is supported by white papers from food safety organizations like TAFS. There are actually many countries that have built the infrastructure to be able to deliver milk from test negative herds. So as I wrap up, uh, Yoni's disease control is a long process. It's a slow, chronic infectious disease. The challenge is not knowing what to do about it. The challenge is doing something about it consistently, day after day, year after year, because Yoni's control may take six to ten years in, in many herds. So it's a very long journey, and it's very easy to get off course. In my view, running control programs in dairy herds for research purposes, the key to success is the veterinarian. The veterinarian has to be there and show up multiple times a year, double checking that the control program is in place and continuing to function exactly as it was designed. Are those maternity pens clean? Are only ELISA negative cows going into that main maternity pen? Are those strong positive cows actually being culled? One of the biggest mistakes I hear in dairy herds is the, the farmer or the veterinarian will say, yes, we test, yes, we use ELISA, and when we get positives, we wait and watch until she goes clinical, and then we cull her. What's the point of doing the test then? You've shot yourself in the foot. We have to label these cows. As herds get larger, everybody on the farm needs to be able to look at a cow, and because she has a special leg band or ear tag, say, that's a, a Yoni's cow. That's a cow that doesn't donate colostrum. That's a cow that isn't used for milk to feed our heifer calves. We have to check colostrum quality and storage. Um, this colostrum has to be collected very hygienically because it's manure contamination of colostrum that can contaminate um, and, in, and infect calves. Check your calf morbidity records. If the Yonish program is tight, the calf uh, health issues uh, will be minimal. And you have to monitor this program and tune it up by regular checking and hopefully witness the declining uh, within herd prevalence. I think Yoni's disease control program should be part of the herd health, the overall herd health program for every single cattle herd in the world. This is a perfect example of One Health. This disease is well entrenched in our domestic animals. It's clearly spilling over to our wildlife and it's probably spilling over to humans as well. The 11 presentations that are about to follow this morning will give you more details about the pathobiology and diagnosis and control of this infection. So I hope you all stay and listen attentively. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank Mike Collins for an excellent overview of the situation. Uh, I hope there'll be some people coming forward with questions. But Mike, what do you feel overall is the what's the most important thing to try and pull everyone together on 
this disease because your whole description is exactly as many of us feel. There's not really enough being done internationally to deal with a very important disease. We're sort of sleepwalking into more and more trouble. And so what? What's the, what? Well, I would, what, how would you see we should collectively react to that? Well, I think practitioners should go home and with every one of their clients, they should make sure that Yoni's disease is part of the discussion and uh, management practices are in place to limit introduction of the infection as well as to control the infection on those farms. Um, I also think that different countries will, will certainly have different s styles of strategy in terms of how much government oversight um, is involved or actually government investment. Um, coming from a very capitalistic part of the world, I, I advocate that pr processors actually be part of the solution and realize that they're part of the, um, uh, the process and, and they need to invest in providing safe food for humans. And so, again, I go back to processors paying a little bit more for milk from test negative herds so that this cost can be shared between processor and producer. Do you have any questions from the floor, please? Yes, Julie? please. Thank you for such an elegant talk, telling us, Joe Brownlee, University of Bristol, for telling us what we do know about Yoni's disease. What is it we don't know about Yoni's disease? What, what is it that you would like to know about the pathogenesis that would be helpful or, or important? There seems to be quite a lot we don't know, but what do you think is important that we do? Well, coming from the International Colloquium on Paratuberculosis held in Nantes just two weeks ago, um, it, it's interestingly that, interesting that we now have more longitudinal studies uh, demonstrating that, at least in sheep and, and possibly in cattle, there are actually some animals that recover from the infection and control the infection. Um, and I don't think we understand uh, the biology of that and why and when does that occur. We've sort of been operating on the assumption that once infected, always infected, and inevitably going to die. Um, but this apparently is not the case. I don't know if it's a, what percentage of animals it is and why those animals are able to master this infection. So I think that's uh, an important uh, knowledge gap, and we can probably benefit a lot from learning as to why that happens. We also, uh, I haven't talked about vaccination as a strategy, um, I, partly because I'm not a big fan of using the vaccine in cattle these days. I do think the vaccine has a place in small ruminants where the, the cost of diagnostics almost exceed the cost of the animal. So um, uh, vaccines have a place. I'm not sure we have the best vaccines yet, and I think we'll see uh, new technology coming forward in the next decade or so with perhaps better vaccines. And they may then play, help us, uh, they may play a, an important role in helping us control this infection. Uh, Liz Wilson, Northern Ireland. I was just wondering when you're trying to control it at a herd level, um, how many calves should be allowed to suckle naturally? Uh, you know, what's the cutoff point? Completely negative calves or slightly positive ca uh, cattle or? Um. Great question, Liz. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. In, in, in our commercial dairy herds, we always are advocating pulling that calf away from the cow in less than an hour. So we're talking about zero suckling. If we, we're, we're talking about beef herds um, or, or even situations where you might want to suckle the calf longer, I, I think then you have to be even more heavily dependent on your diagnostics and make sure that that cow, to the best of your ability, is completely test negative. We have to accept the limitations that Eliza is going to make some mistakes there. But I think even Eliza negative cows who are infected are perhaps not infectious. And so I would consider um, allowing suckling for an, uh, a longer period of time when the cow's flat negative on Eliza. Okay, thank you. Hello. Mike. Hi, Mike. Kieran, Kieran Mead from Chagas. Um, thanks for a great talk. I just wanted to ask a quick question about um, the survival of paratuberculosis. And um, we know there are reports saying that the mycobacteria can survive within semen. And I'm wondering if AI companies are routinely testing, particularly in the US, for paratuberculosis in bulls. And the second part of my question is, um, 
in relation to the survival of the mycobacteria in bedding or on pasture if it is spread in contaminated um, feces? Thank you. Uh, excellent question. Our bull studs all test repair tuberculosis every six months because uh, it's mandated to, uh, to export semen to the EU particularly. So all of our bulls are, are extensively tested both by ELISA and culture every six months. Uh, as to the survival of the organism in the environment, uh, you know, I think the, the numbers are still about a year. Depends how many organisms are there. Um, once a cow pad hits the ground and if it has 10 para in it, it's going to be nine next month and eight. And it'll take about a year to die off. Uh, sunlight, harsh environments, freezing and thawing all uh, will help hasten the demise of the organism. But it's, a, it's probably one of my most common questions when answering uh, calls. Uh, about paratuberculosis and I try to step back from that question and, and because people get very intense about my, my pasture's contaminated and what do I do and, and all this stuff and my opinion is that we can let nature take its course, the pastures will clean themselves, the organism's going to die away, I don't think it's a major source of infection risk. The most important thing is to find the shedders and quit contaminating the pastures in the first place. So I mostly ignore treatment of pastures and try to calm the worries about spread of the organism from contaminated pastures. And I focus on getting those infectious cows off the property in the first place. So cut it off at the source, the environment will clean itself. Probably the one caveat there is I think contaminated ponds or water sources actually are probably our biggest risk. It's not the cow pie on the ground, it's the runoff that collects in, in, a, in a surface waters. And so I argue to fence those off and provide well water. Thank you. Could I take uh, a question from the back there first? Uh, Mike McGann, Animal Health Ireland. Mike, history is littered with examples of society knowing something and failing to act when there's irrefutable evidence that we should do so. Help us now, help me sell a concept um, to an industry that's reluctant to, to pay to do so. Tell me how we now move in Ireland to have a robust, a robust uh, scheme that will encourage and get to the right end result. Because I haven't, while you've given a very dramatic example of why we should, I will not be able to get an industry to move on that. I need more. Well, sadly, I, I'm in your camp. If you look at human history, we only respond to calamity. And... Uh, I would, my guess is we will wait for the calamity to happen. We don't have to, we have the tools, but we will wait for the calamity. There is a, a multinational, multi-centered, double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trial underway to treat Crohn's patients with a cocktail of three antibiotics, and uh, Australian uh, gastroenterologists have already shown an 80% success rate. If that bears out to be true in this very large trial, I think that will be the last piece of the puzzle that will convince the medical community that in fact many cases of Crohn's disease are infectious and due to MAP. And then we're going to be in the catch-up mode and we're going to have to do all this in, in a hurry. It's just a sad testimony to human nature that we will wait for the calamity to happen probably before springing into action and then we'll wonder why we didn't do something sooner. So a further question from here? Thank you, Doctor. Uh, how much the pasteurization of colostrum can affect on controlling of this disease? We're seeing in the U.S. Uh, the introduction of on-farm pasteurizers quite extensively, as, mostly as a cost-saving measure to, to save on, on milk replacer. And I think pasteurizing milk for calves on-farm is a great idea, provided you do it well. Pasteurizing colostrum proves to be harder and there's this delicate balance of how much heat for how long before you compromise the antibody. I haven't personally tried to pasteurize colostrum, but so many people tell me that it turns into a thick gel that you can't feed the calf that I become a believer that I would rather focus on only getting colostrum from ELISA negative cows, collecting it very hygienically, and then go on to feed it and not wrestle with trying to pasteurize it. I do like pasteurizing the milk, the true milk, fed to calves afterward, but not, I don't think it's worth the effort for colostrum. But it can help. Okay. We've
we've got time for another question here. Hello. If me man, friends. Uh, we all know that the major uh, contamination source is uh, provided by feces, but we have heard through um, elegant studies that now aerosol contamination may also lead to paratuberculosis. What do you think of that particular way of uh, contamination? Well, just like with the contamination of pastures, certainly there's a theoretical risk of transmission from pastures. There's a theoretical risk of transmission by aerosol, but the vast majority of this organism is in the manure. And I f suggest not getting distracted by that evidence, but focus on the major real problem first, and the, the aerosol thing will go away. Okay, yes. so there's, last this will have to be the last question from <laughs> Nisa there. Listen, um, when we look at um, either dairy or beef herds, which are infected, and uh, when we go to old cows, let's say four or five parity cows, uh, we find among them uh, cows which are not infected and which have been exposed to the same challenge uh, than the others who have become infected. Uh, have you an idea of if there is any more uh, characteristics which allows them to uh, remain as such or probably they have been transiently infected and cured themselves. Have you, a, have you a clue on this? I have no clue, but I, I, I would uh, emphasize that exposure in, at, of adult cows to infectious manure I don't think is of much consequence. I think it's only exposure of calves. But even then, we have to recognize this is an infectious disease. And all infectious diseases, there is an element of random chance. Influenza will spread across the world every, every year, but not everybody Everybody will likely be exposed, not everybody will become infected and diseased. Some of that is just chance. Um, but if you're asking for specific biological characteristics, I don't think we yet know why some animals may be able to handle the infection better than others. We don't understand that yet. Okay, so that must be the last question, but thank you, audience, for excellent participation. Thanks, Mike, again.